Good morning and continuing with our program, I have to introduce Rajay Makuana and also I like to call together Adam Parson. Uh, Rajay Makuana is a, the executive director of Chair of the World Resources, STWR, a civil society organization campaigning for a fair sharing of wealth, power and resources within and between nations. Rajay is passionate about applying the principles of sharing as a solution to global crisis and has written numerous publications, shared general panel discussion, and advocated for the concept of economic sharing in debates and presentations in the UK and overseas. STWR was funded in 2003, consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations in 2009. Uh, Rajay, and please. And also at the same time, we have Adam Parsons. Adam is the editor at Chair the World Resources, STWR. Before joining STWR, Adam worked as a journalist and editor of for national and regional newspapers in England before spending a number of years in South Asia and Australia as a freelance writer on travel and development, is development issues. Since joining the team at uh, STWR, Adam has specialized in issues of food insecurity, urban poverty, and people's movement. And has authored numerous publications, including Mega, Mega Slumming, The Seven Myths of Slums, and When Will Ordinary People Rise Up. When Will Ordinary People Would Rise Up? That's very interesting. And how <laughs> United, United Voice of the Public Will Transform the World. With you, um, Adam and Rajay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it really is a rare pleasure to be at a conference where the theme for the day is uh, sharing the commons. Um, the organization Adam and I work for, Share the World's Resources, have been uh, raising awareness and highlighting the need to apply sharing as a solution to global crisis for some years now. But it's really just been in, in recent years that uh, a growing number of people and organizations have been framing some of their ideas directly in terms of sharing, which of course is very welcome development. And as, as we're going to explain, um, a, a definite trend, I think, that looks uh, set to continue over the coming years. Um, so Adam and I will put forward our perspective on sharing the world's resources during the course of this presentation, which we've divided more or less equally between us. Um, a good place for me to start this discussion uh, would be to examine a little bit more closely what we mean by this term economic sharing uh, and why we think it's imperative that nations find ways of uh, sharing the world's wealth, power and resources more equitably and sustainably. So Adam will, after myself, Adam will go on to explain in more detail about how governments could implement various forms of economic sharing as a pragmatic solution to some of the, the crises that humanity faces today. So, David? Um, so I'd like to start by asking a, a very basic question. What is sharing? Uh, well, we all know, of course, what, what sharing is. We all engage in sharing within our families, our, our homes, and uh, our communities. But if we briefly uh, just examine the concept of sharing a little more closely, we can see that it can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Uh, so, for example, people often think about sharing in terms of giving and associate it with forms of philanthropy and charity. In relation to tangible resources, this idea of sharing as giving implies ownership since we cannot give something away unless it belongs to us in the first place. The same is true, of course, when sharing is considered in terms of reciprocity, which also suggests that there is an obligation to repay a gift or favour <coughs> received. But the principle of sharing is um, a much broader and more inclusive term uh, that is not necessarily limited to notions of ownership and gifting. When it is used in relation to the concept of the commons, the principle of sharing also means to use jointly, which implies that a shared resource is not necessarily owned uh, or given or received, but can be collectively managed and is freely accessible to all stakeholders. So sharing is really quite a versatile concept, but regardless of which type of sharing we are referring to, 
It's also important to recognize that sharing is far more central to life than people often realize. And it's entirely appropriate to talk about uh, sharing as a universal principle. As you can see from the slide, there are, of course, many examples of sharing in the natural world that have already been studied by, by scientists. We can talk about planet Earth itself and many of its natural cycles as embodying the principle of sharing, as well as the activities and behaviours of cells, plants, flowers and groups of highly social animals. But there's also a growing body of evidence uh, from evolutionary biologists and behavioural scientists that demonstrates how human beings are actually hardwired to cooperate and share. And there's a growing consensus that without such traits as sharing and cooperation, it is unlikely that we would have survived and evolved as a species. Anthropological studies of people living in traditional communities have also revealed that various forms of sharing and giving often form the basis of economic life. And it's no surprise that uh, sharing also, and along with equality, um, often is quite central to many of the world's religions. Um, but despite the prevalence of sharing throughout kingdoms of nature and in family life, we have largely failed to create a world that reflects sharing in our social, economic and political structures. Instead, drawing on the theories of enlightenment thinkers, mainstream economists and policymakers have fashioned a world based on the assumption that human beings are inherently selfish, competitive, acquisitive and individualistic. Assumptions that of course underpin the concept of homo economicus. And as the slide highlights, adopting these assumptions has meant we've pushed aside the importance of ethics and human values when making economic policy decisions. And, of course, this has led to the creation of uh, quite competitive economic systems that are inherently unjust and highly unequal, as we've been hearing about today. Globally, uh, we would say this approach is also responsible for creating um, an extremely competitive international framework that goes very much against the principle of sharing and prevents nations cooperating effectively. And, of course, as recent evidence of this, uh, we can mention the repeated breakdown of the Doha trade talks, uh, our failure to limit carbon emissions under the UNFCCC negotiations, and even the negligible, negligible progress made um, at the Rio Plus 20 talks last year to establish a viable p uh, path for sustainable development. So if our collective failure to share is responsible for increasing inequalities and exacerbating many of the other crises we face, then it stands to reason that we need uh, to find ways of reforming our political and economic systems by bringing them more in line with this principle of sharing. From this perspective, the term economic sharing can be used to describe the application of the principle of sharing to how governments organise economies and distribute available resources, which could include many of the resources we could refer to as the commons, um, anything from wealth and natural resources to knowledge and technology. And economic sh sharing can also, of course, uh, apply to systems of democracy in terms of how fairly political power is shared throughout society. Um, so the concept of economic sharing reconnects human values to economic policy. In economic terms, sharing is concerned with securing basic human needs and rights and is naturally aligned with the concept of social and economic justice. And the effective process of economic sharing, therefore, requires the implementation of government policies, laws and regulations. And it points to the need for long-term structural solutions that cut to the heart of how we organise societies and manage the commons. It's also important to make the point that economic sharing isn't just another ism uh, related to a specific set of ideologies or policies. The principle of sharing precedes the doctrines of capitalism, communism and socialism, and it doesn't inherently oppose or support any other uh, economic idea. But of course that's not to say that existing concepts and policies don't reflect or even embody the principle of sharing as they do in many cases. In fact, economic sharing already underpins a huge variety of familiar practices, institutions and policies that operate at the local and national level. Um, and the next slide highlights just a few examples of this. Great. Um, so we can, for example, talk about how agricultural land was traditionally managed as a commons, or how sharing seeds has always been uh, integral to farming practices. Many of you will also be familiar with the sharing economy movement, uh, which encompasses everything from collaborative consumption to food banks and gift economies. But economic sharing is even more fundamental to how we organise societies than even these examples demonstrate. Arguably the most advanced form of economic sharing that exists in the modern world is the pooling of a nation's financial resources to ensure that everybody has access to healthcare, 
education, social security and other essential public services. And of course, you know, we, we can mention land value taxation uh, as it inherently embodies the principle of sharing and is an altogether fairer way of raising public revenue than taxing income alone. So as these examples demonstrate, the general point is that applying the principle of sharing to an economic system has the potential to promote social equity, strengthen the social fabric of communities and, and improve levels of well-being across society. Next slide. But what about sharing internationally? We live in a globalised world where the crises we face, whether we refer to wealth disparities or climate change, affect all nations to a greater or lesser extent. Globalised systems of communication, trade and finance mean that people in different countries live highly interconnected and interdependent lives. Given these realities, there is no logical reason for any process of economic sharing to take place slowly, solely within a national context. In the 21st century, we really need to start thinking about and actively applying a process of economic sharing on a planetary scale. So from a worldwide perspective, sharing means ensuring that people in all countries, including future generations, can access sufficient resources to meet their needs and live in dignity without transgressing planetary limits. And global economic sharing is surely impossible uh, without extending the concepts of justice, socio-economic rights and environmental sustainability to include the entire community of nations and the planet as a whole. Of course, this requires governments and individuals to accept that all people are part of an extended human family with the same basic rights and needs, and then to establish policies and institutions at the global level that embodies this, un this recognition and ensures that these rights are fulfilled. Slide, please. In reality, systems of economic sharing at the global level are still very much in their infancy. Unlike the practice of sharing within countries, there is no equivalent system of taxation or public spending internationally that can provide the level of support that developing countries urgently need. The main exception is the international aid provided by donor countries each year. But aid donations today are grossly insufficient, ineffective and often problematic for recipient countries. Similarly, global governance institutions such as the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund don't reflect global economic sharing as they could and should. As campaigners have long argued, these global bodies are undemocratic in their administration, highly biased in their ideology as they pursue free market solutions over the need for social and economic justice. And of course, even the United Nations is in need of considerable reform to render it more democratic, effective and inclusive. Clearly, economic sharing is still not sufficiently expressed in the governance systems and economic structures that underpin the global economy. And in many ways, it's this failure to share resources globally that is ultimately responsible for many of the interrelated global crises we face. So before I hand over to Adam, I'd just like to briefly outline the extent of some of these crises and the broad relevance that sharing has to addressing them. So to begin with, um, we're all aware of the high numbers of people who now live in poverty in the so-called developed world, especially as austerity measures continue to amplify the effects of the economic crisis. As this slide highlights, nothing describes the dangerous shift away from the practice of sharing within societies more than the growing levels of hunger, poverty and needless deprivation in rich countries. Newspapers are filled with the sorts of statistics about growing unemployment, poverty and the, and, and the expanding number of people who can't afford enough food to eat. However, there's no escaping the fact that the impact of extreme poverty in the global south remains far more severe than in northern countries. But the extent to which life-threatening deprivation devastates the lives of millions of families in poorer countries is commonly ignored by the mainstream media and is often unknown among affluent society. According to the World Bank's figures on global poverty, 95% of people in developing countries survive on less than $10 a day. And just to clarify what that means, that's equivalent to what $10 would, would, would purchase in the United States. Next slide. But even less discussed is the true extent of the global emergency of need, needless poverty-related deaths, which is far greater than all of the deaths related to conflict, natural disasters, or climate change. Overall, we calculated using the World Health Organization statistics that around 15 million people die each year, mainly in low- or middle-income countries, as a consequence of a lack of access to basic food, clean water, adequate shelter, and medical assistance. So this is where we can talk about the need for international sharing in its most immediate and critical aspect, in terms of the emergency measures required to end life-threatening deprivation as a foremost global priority. Yet any meaningful level of international sharing is far from the radar screens of world leaders today, 
The best, the best commitment we currently have is at the first millennium development goal, which even if it's met, will still leave around a billion people uh, living in extreme poverty in 2015. And even the, recent, uh, the recently agreed post-2015 development agenda is extremely unambitious in relation to ending poverty. Next slide, please. Although it does contain a commitment to completely eradicate extreme poverty by 2030, the poverty threshold they refer to is unacceptably low at $1.25 a day, which would leave millions of people still living on less than $2.50 a day in 2030. Another illustration of the need for economic sharing is the growing gap between rich and poor. According to statistics on global inequality, the world as a whole is far more unequal than even the most unequal country. And currently, the richest 300 people on, on Earth have more wealth than the poorest 3 billion. Indeed, the rich nations hold 90% of the world's wealth and account for just 18% of its population. Such vast levels of global inequality highlights the need for a massive transfer of finance from north to south as a correction to existing unjust economic arrangements. The other great challenge of our time is how to drastically reduce global carbon emissions and manage consumption levels within environmental constraints. It's often said that humanity is currently consuming natural resources at a rate 50% faster than the planet can replenish them, which means we already require the equivalent of one and a half planets to support our consumption needs. Yet demand for resources of all kinds is, increasingly, is increasing exponentially due to both a growing population and rising affluence in emerging economies. Next. But the challenge of sharing the planet's finite resources sustainably is further complicated by the huge imbalances in consumption patterns across the world. Currently, the wealthiest 20% of the world's population consume around 80% of global resources um, and are therefore responsible for the vast majority of global warming and environmental destruction. Meanwhile, the poorest 20% of the population lack sufficient access to essentials such as food, clean water and energy and account for around 1% of global resource consumption. So it's clear that if the world's finite resources are to be made accessible to all people and consumed at a sustainable rate, um, then the greatest reductions in the use of natural resources has to come from the world's richest consumers. In other words, a socially just solution to the environmental crisis necessitates a far greater sharing of resources on a global scale. You can see in this slide some examples of different formulas or frameworks developed by campaign groups. Actually, I think... I think I'm out of sync, can't I? That's the one. Sorry about that. You can see in this slide some examples of different formulas of frameworks developed by campaign groups, all of which essentially highlight the need for sharing the world's natural resources more equitably and sustainably. Of course, most governments have no interest whatsoever in the wholesale reorganisation of the economy that these models would entail. Um, that is especially true of those governments who are held bent on competing uh, for the world's remaining fossil fuel reserves and other energy sources rather than finding ways of sharing them globally. So this leads on to a last point. If the planet has finite resources and nation states are continuing to compete for control over them, then there are clearly grave implications for future peace and security, especially in a world that's awash with nuclear weapons. Next slide. Resource wars are perhaps the most dangerous consequence of our failure to share in economic terms. Historically, the powerful have always waged war to gain control over land and resources. Between 1965 and 1990, 73 civil wars over resources occurred, in which more than 1,000 people died a year, and at least 18 international conflicts have been triggered by competition for resources since then, including, of course, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The possibility of future conflict is ever-growing as nations race to control oil and gas reserves in the Arctic, in the East and South China Seas and around the Falkland Islands and, and elsewhere. Next slide, please. So to put it simply, unless nations find ways of sharing rather than competing over these resources, a number of factors all but guarantee a further escalation of resource wars in the near future. And these include a rising population, global, uh, soaring global consumption rates, rapidly disappearing energy su supplies, and of course, climate change. What this means in the 21st century is that any viable security strategy for ensuring sustainable and universal access to resources for all nations must be based on governments, governance systems that facilitate economic sharing on a global scale. Next slide, please. This is well recognized by progressive analysts, such as Professor Michael T. Clare, who is quoted here from his well-known book, Resource Wars. He says, 
it's it seems reasonable to ask whether a resource acquisition strategy based on global cooperation rather than recurring conflict might not prove more effective in guaranteeing access to critical supplies over the long run. And such a strategy would call for the equitable distribution of the world's existing resource stockpiles in times of acute scarcity. But of course, such an epic transformation in geopolitics can only happen if nations overcome their competitive and nationalistic tendencies and put the needs and rights of all people before the interests of any one nation. While such a framework might seem extremely idealistic or radical within the current paradigm, it's also inevitable if humanity is ever to end centuries of warfare over access to resources and instead create a more peaceful and sustainable future world. Final slide. So what I've tried to do is just explain very simply what, uh, what we mean by economic sharing and why it should inform policies that seek to address the urgent social, environmental and security crisis that humanity now faces. As this last slide here demonstrates, it ultimately requires very little imagination to see how the principle of sharing can play an important role in mitigating these crises. Uh, but anyway, all of this is still to talk in rather general terms, so I think I'll hand over now to Adam, who will, who will uh, pick up from there and, and talk more about uh, what economic sharing means um, in terms of policies on the, on the global level. Okay. I just check how long I've got so I don't uh, drone on too long. I'll see where you're at. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and talk 10, 15 minutes, see how we get on. But yeah, just, just to really pick up from what Rajesh has been saying. Uh, as he, he's discussed why it makes sense to, to talk about economic sharing in, in political terms, economic terms, and also what sharing means in a general sense. Um, but what, what could sharing mean in practice as a policy framework? In other words, how could any process of economic sharing actually take place on, on a global level? And how could such a process unfold in the face of today's seemingly insurmountable barriers to progress? So, yeah, if, if you know, if our, um, so, well, by way of a basic definition, we could say that, is that okay? <laughs> Perfect. So, by, by way of a basic definition, um, we could say that economic sharing means to act cooperatively as a global community of nations. And it means recognizing the environmental limits that we have to work within according to the principle of equity. And it means, therefore, transforming the structures and institutions that perpetuate the global crises we face. Um, but if, if our human understanding of sharing is to mean anything at all in a world of plenty, I mean, it must surely mean an end to all instances of life-threatening deprivation and poverty-related deaths as, as a foremost global priority. Um, it was already mentioned, um, maybe next slide, it was already mentioned that, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and it, every, day, every day we fail to act, an additional 40,000 people or, or will die from preventable causes, uh, many from a uh, lack of access to adequate food, clean water and essential health care. And at the same time, ecological turmoil is triggering natural disasters that are already devastating communities and escalating um, poverty, displacement and deprivation. And according to some estimates, climate change is now contributing to the avoidable deaths of around 40, 400,000 people every year. And these figures don't even include the harsh impacts of austerity policies and the effects of the financial crisis, which, as we know, are widening inequalities and causing profound hardship for millions of people across the world. But um, government rhetoric might convince us that policymakers are doing a great deal already to help prevent unnecessary hardship both at home and abroad. But this is, is far from the re reality. And um, Rajesh again mentioned um, how unambitious the post-2015 development agenda uh, really is, and how the current development goals certainly don't embody the concept of economic sharing from the perspective of social and economic justice. And there are just a, a few figures on this slide that help put into perspective how comparatively little financial resources are needed to mitigate hunger and address extreme poverty. For example, providing basic social protection to all people living in extreme poverty um, only requires around 2% of global GDP. And we know that ensuring the poor, that the poorest people have enough food, um, energy and income could be achieved very easily and with little additional demand on planetary resources. 
So in light of the humanitarian impacts of the global emergency we face, it is clear that government policies remain wholly distorted and that we are not even beginning to do enough. Uh, next slide, please. In, in a recent report uh, called Financing the Global Sharing Economy, um, we illustrated how governments could mobilize more than enough money to reverse austerity measures, um, prevent life-threatening deprivation, and mitigate the human impacts of climate change. And one of the key intentions of, of the report was to, to make the simple case that governments could mobilize these resources within the framework of the current economic system. And even before initiating the more complex and lengthy process of restructuring the world economy. And we calculated that, that by implementing these, these 10 policies, governments could raise trillions of dollars every year to help strengthen and scale up systems of sharing and redistribution, um, both nationally and globally. And the, these figures may be broad estimates, but they, they demonstrate the potential for governments to collect and redistribute a huge quantities of additional public finance for critical human needs, often money that policymakers have led the public to believe does not exist or cannot be found during a time of economic crisis. Um, it's important to note that the institutional structures, the mechanisms and the expertise needed to utilise these additional financial resources um, have long been in place. You know, these include numerous humanitarian organisations such as you know, the Red Cross, many UN organisations and agencies including the, the World Food Programme, thousands of NGOs as well as established global funds um, to help facilitate climate change adaptation and mitigation in developing countries. Yet not since the, the Brandt Commission's proposal in 1980 for an emergency programme of assistance to developing countries have policymakers seriously considered a large-scale transfer of resources from north to south, from rich regions of the world to poorer regions, as a first part of a programme of um, international economic restructuring. The necessary political will to implement Brandt's programme of economic sharing was lacking at the time. But the scale of the humanitarian emergency is far greater today. If governments are ever to end this moral travesty, we cannot afford the same level of political and public complacency to continue. So, so to be clear, any such program to redistribute the, the financial commons, as it were, will not address the underlying causes of poverty, inequality, or climate change. And addressing these systemic causes presents a huge challenge that will ultimately require substantial reforms to our economic systems, from the way we extract, um, produce, distribute and consume resources to the influence that multinational corporations wield over society and policy making. But these urgent reforms cannot occur until nations move beyond the self-interest and aggressive competition that characterises domestic and foreign policy, um, and which will, which will obviously require dramatic um, you know, challenging the dominant economic model that most governments are heavily invested in maintaining. Nevertheless, in order to inspire public support for transformative change, it is worthwhile to discuss a, a broad outline of the kind of new economic arrangements that will be needed in order to share the world's resources in any, in any literal sense. Perhaps the most essential step towards implementing any systemic form of global economic sharing is for the international community to recognise that natural resources form part of our shared commons and should therefore be managed um, in a, a way that benefits all nations. For example, you know, at the moment it's impossible to underestimate how far we, we are away from, from such a recognition. You know, for example, we know that developing countries are still underrepresented in the decision-making processes of the world economy. And the richest countries remain unwilling to change a globalized system of trade and finance that is l largely structured in their favor. And right now, there still doesn't exist a central international body that is fully empowered to oversee coordinated action from all countries on the entire range of global development issues, let alone to discuss the cooperative management of the global commons. But however far-fetched it may seem within the current framework, and however we, we may be forced to get to this point, sooner or later humanity is going to have to take collective responsibility for stewarding the, the planet's finite resources in a sustainable manner. So, um, a precedent for sharing natural resources is already well established. Um, an existing principle in international law, known as the common heritage of humankind, which I'm sure you've heard about, um, enables certain cultural and natural resources to be protected from exploitation, both from the private and, the, and state sector, by holding them in trust for future generations. And as you can see from, from this slide, this, this principle is an important feature in a number of international treaties
that have taken shape under the auspices of the United Nations. And there are many options outlined by progressive thinkers for how a similar kind of trusteeship over the world's natural resources could be organized on a global level. For example, you could, you could refer to the work of James Quilligan or Peter Barnes, or the ideas outlined in the book Right Relationship by Peter Brown and Jeffrey Garber, as well as indeed the concepts of a, a global resource agency as discussed by Alana Hartzog, who's uh, presenting this afternoon. Um, yeah, next slide, please, Dave. Uh, drawing on the ideas put forward by, by such writers, this slide very simply outlines the basic principle for how such a trust could, could work. Essentially, a global commons trust could set a cap on a particular resource to ensure it is used sustainably and protected for future generations. Businesses could then rent a proportion of the resource from the trust rather than own it. And the rent paid for the resource could be used to fund a range of social or environmental needs. And regardless of how such a trust is organized, it stands to reason that if resources are managed in the interest of all nations, it could be possible to harmonize the world's hugely unequal consumption patterns, even though achieving such a balance is obviously a tremendous challenge in a world that is driven by consumerism. So the, the basic premise of the adjustment would clearly necessitate the world's over-consuming countries to significantly reduce their resource use, while less developed countries increase theirs until a convergence in global per capita consumption is eventually uh, reached. This, this broad concept is similar to the contraction and convergence framework, um, which is already widely proposed and discussed in relation to tackling climate change, um, as originally proposed by Audrey Mayer of the Global Commons Institute. There's also been a lot of work done on the concept of environmental space, um, which is basically a tool to help understand the changes that will be needed if each nation is to use only its fair share of global resources. Um, these, these discussions on managing the global commons um, can sometimes seem quite technical, but uh, the, the underlying principle is, is actually very straightforward, as these, these series of cartoons make clear. The currently unequal patterns of global resource consumption is clearly unsustainable. Um, but the planets could not sustain, um, maybe on the next slide, the planet cannot sustain everyone at the same consumption levels as the richest countries. Hence, the only way to realize ecologically and socially sustainable development is to share the world's environmental space. Um, in other words, to ensure that all people have the right to equitable shares of water, food, air, land, and other resources within the carrying capacity of the Earth. It's really that simple. But of course, the, you know, the, these graphics are actually, they were taken from a book called um, Sharing the World, which was a project of Friends of the Earth some years ago now. And there's been a lot of, a lot of debate on this basic concept in the whole discourse on sustainable development especially since the 1990s. Of course, any groundbreaking international framework for sharing natural resources would be impossible without also implementing new, more democratic, inclusive, and effective forms of global governance. And the, the United Nations, although in need of significant reform and democratization, would clearly have uh, an important role to play in this process. On the next slide, um, at the national level, you can see that the real challenge is obviously reducing consumption levels in the industrialized nations. And again, lots of proposals already exist for how to achieve this. Among the many reforms needed, it is clear that resource management would need to be at the forefront of policy making, and consumption-led economic growth can no longer be the, the goal of government policy. Um, much also needs to be done to dismantle the culture of consumerism through restricting advertising, implementing better training standards, ending planned obsolescence, and of course, Investment patterns must shift to building and sustaining a low-carbon infrastructure alongside a, a vast array of energy and resource efficiency measures. Um, next slide. This is, you know, this is merely a snapshot of the immense changes that would be needed if any process of, of global economic sharing was implemented as a solution to the world's environmental and developmental crises. Needless to say, all of these reforms remain off the radar for most policymakers given the, the unwillingness of governments to even accept the principle that everyone should be given a fair share of the world's resources. The dominant trend is still towards the centralization of state and market power and the shifting of real power away from ordinary people and communities towards largely undemocratic global institutions and multinational corporations. And as each critical year passes by, we are paying witness to the, the further concentration and control of private interests over land, resources, and, and all aspects of people's lives. 
Hence, overcoming the vested interests that continue to block progress on restructuring the, the world economy has long been regarded by activists and campaigners as the most significant challenge of the 21st century. Yet what's clear is that civil society organizations and campaigning groups are not sufficiently united or strong enough to challenge these immense forces of, of profit, power and control. There's a quite significant literature that discusses the limitations of large civil society organizations to effect transformative structural change as most of the mainstream CSOs work within the same business as usual political context as governments and the private sector, or else they remain focused on single issues and short-term wins, or they are constrained by uh, a narrow policy-oriented approach. So if it is clear that governments, private institutions, and civil society organizations acting alone are not capable of steering the world onto a just and sustainable course, perhaps the question is, can we imagine a new movement of ordinary people that can fill the vacuum in global leadership? And it is the growing power of the people's voice capable of being organized into some kind of implacable countervailing force that no government or vested interest can withstand. This is a question that is actually being asked by a number of campaigners and intellectuals who are now talking about the need for a global citizens movement in some way. And the dramatic uh, series of events since late 2010 have provided concrete evidence of the potential power of united people's voice to affect wholesale systemic change. Um, the world is now witnessing uh, millions of people in diverse countries who are declaring their needs and highlighting issues of social and economic inequality, greed, financial corruption, and the undue influence of corporations on government. Um, and what's interesting to note um, is that these various protests and mobilizations are all calling for greater sharing in society in one way or another. And what connects them is their revulsion against an economic system that has caused such huge inequalities in wealth and income. So for example, uh, many of the Arab uprisings may have mobilized to oust repressive di dictatorships, but they also reflected a worldwide reaction to enormous and growing socioeconomic divisions. There are also uh, massive calls now for an end to austerity measures, or for more progressive taxation, um, as in the UK and US uncut actions, or calls for an end to greed and inequality, um, as in the Occupy protests or the Indignados, or calls for the sharing and conservation of natural resources, as in the Idle No More demonstrations that we've been seeing in Canada. There were just a, a, just a few examples on this slide of many, but what's also interesting to note is that all of these movements begin spontaneously um, peacefully and without any clear leadership or hierarchical structure. And there's an implicit understanding common to all the, the various demands in different countries, which is that governments are better able to, to meet the needs of all their citizens through the provision of more effective welfare and public services. So the, the question that remains is whether the need for sharing and progressive forms of redistribution can be recognized at the international level where the unequal distribution of wealth and power manifests in extreme and ever-growing discrepancies in living standards between the richest and poorest people. As it says here on, on the slide, so far, the priorities of the new wave of protesters still tend to be national in their focus, or else they remain concerned with social justice and inequality within the context of the, the rich industrialized nations. But is it possible to envisage a collective demand for a fairer sharing of the world's resources that unify citizens of the richest and poorest nations on a common platform, one that recognizes the need for, for global as well as national forms of redistribution as a pathway to ending poverty and extreme inequality. So, so this, this leads to a conclusion that may seem radical despite its obviousness and simplicity. What we're deducing is that perhaps a necessary process of economic restructuring and world rehabilitation can only begin with a united people's voice that speaks on behalf of the, the poorest and mo most disenfranchised and gives the highest priority to the elimination of extreme deprivation and needless poverty-related deaths. If this is a prospect that we can take seriously, then we need to ask if it's possible to envisage a vast swathe of the world population in the, the rich world as well as the poor, rising up in peaceful protest to demand a more equal distribution of the food, raw materials, and energy sources of the planet. 
You know, can we foresee masses of ordinary people who genuinely identify themselves as brothers and sisters of one human family and who therefore demand that all the resources, technology, and scientific know-how of the world are freely shared among everyone? If so, and if the case for global sharing captures the public imagination as quickly as the calls for distributed justice within individual countries, then perhaps an end to poverty and injustice could finally become a realistic possibility. So, thank you for listening. Uh, I know together we've probably been speaking for quite a long time, but uh, what I hope Rajesh and I have conveyed in this presentation, if nothing else, is just how versatile and important is the principle of sharing to this great transition the world is going through, which at the end of the day um, can all be summed up in the title of this conference um, and the theme of today's talks, which is about you know, a new economics for conscious evolution, and ultimately about nations coming together to work out the necessary structures and institutions for sharing the global commons. And that's about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is abuse, right? <laughs> <laughs> So we have like 10 minutes for Q&A, and... Um, How's that? Yeah, it's fantastic. I have a question about the definition of sharing. When we have government programs that provide resources to people in need, that are financed by taxes, that are collected under threat of imprisonment, does that fit the definition of sharing, or would it better be called extortion? Well, I think we'd all agree that. I, I think I think most people would agree that that's not quite in line with the spirit of the principle of sharing. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't classify that as sharing, of course. Sure. Could, could you elaborate? You know, you I think you've taken sort of a, a more general strategy, one that you know, at, at least in relation to our strategy for raising awareness about LVT is, is a bit of, uh, oblique and has some, um, maybe some, some strengths that, that we don't have and maybe some weaknesses that we don't have and, you know, what, what can we learn about the way that you present your meme um, that, 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 that might be useful for us as maybe more single issue, uh, single issue type? That's a very interesting question. Shall I, shall I try? Okay. Um, well, I think, I think that one of the differences is, of course, when you're talking about LVT, it's a very specific set of policies. It's a very established understanding that can be traced back to Henry George and, and, and many other people, I'm sure, who have been uh, in, engaged and involved in, in explaining this, this concept. When it comes to sharing, it is far more broader, and we very purposely take a very broad perspective on it. And we do that for a number of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is we found through our research that there are actually many different organizations out there that are talking about sharing in one way or another. And, and, and if we hold that in our minds and also think, well, actually, how are we all people of goodwill who want to create a better world, a more sustainable, peaceful, more equitable world, how is that ever going to happen? Well, it's only ever going to happen if there is some, some, some coming together, some unity, some, common, some, some, some sort of common purpose and common cause. And, and, and what we've recognized is, is we think that, that the simple idea of sharing is it, something that we can all relate to. Whatever, whatever organization or campaign we're working on, wherever in the world we may be. And we feel that there is a way of, of using that meme, as you put it, to bring people together, to create a platform for a united call for sharing. Because a lot of these people who are working, for example, on issues around climate change, where equity and sharing is, is a central progressive call for dealing with that problem, would probably agree very much with the idea of land value taxation and vice versa. And there are other examples as well that we can refer to. We can talk about conflicts over the world's resources as we touched on, for example. I mean, you know, we, we, we all recognize that we cannot continue like this. We need to share. So there are so many different areas, so many different organizations who are touching on sharing, the Occupy movement, inequality. I mean, it's all about sharing redistribution or whatever you, and of course there are, there are differences within that and, 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 and how, do we, how do we share, how do we redistribute, how do we raise revenues, etc. These are all valid questions, sometimes quite technical questions as well. But, you know, our, our focus is not perhaps to focus on the detail of them technicalities because what's lacking at the moment is even an understanding that we need to move to a different, a, a different world. 
There's that, even that's lacking, let alone the technicalities of specific policies which we need to get there. And so that's, that's been our focus. And I, I don't know if Adam wants to add anything to that. Um, well, maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah, it's, sure. It's a, it's a great question. It's a, a, a conversation, really. But um, you know, what, what I was trying to just get across in the kind of simple framing we're doing um, in terms of talking about economic sharing, global economic sharing, sharing the world's resources, it's a way of bringing these complex issues down to earth and trying to give a sense of that umbrella that we're all actually coming from the same place. There's different emphasis, different means, different frameworks. But you know, everyone here is an engaged citizen, a progressively minded, humanitarian minded. And there's a real problem in reaching out to the, you know, the other people, maybe even in our families and our, our own networks, we, you, we may encounter the fact that a lot of people, they're just, just not interested or they feel that these are issues that are not for them. They're the, the work of specialists. And there's this very much in our society that everyone's you know, kind of constrained to a certain you know, way of thinking, a certain line of thought. And it's about how to bring that all together, how to create a, a, a framework. So if you look at uh, tax, I mean, in the UK, there's UK Uncuts, who have really done a huge work to bring forward the idea of tax. And they're talking about tax really within the current system, income tax. They have a very simple message, which is, you know, here we've got a, a government who is cutting public services, you know, trying to privatise the NHS, cutting away uh, legal aid, etc., etc. And if they just tax corporations better, they could you know, generate, they, they say like 95 billion pounds a year could be generated just from, by closing certain tax loopholes on corporations, enough money to fund the NHS for a year, for example. But yet, you know, that's just one message and it's, people are getting behind that. But then how do you mobilise people on a, a, more, a more technical issue, which if you look at it, whichever way you slice LVT, makes total sense. But it's how to get that public mobilisation behind it. That's one of the reasons we look at sharing. Is so, you know, I can talk to my mum about sharing and she'll, she'll get it. And then you can kind of bring in policies to that. And also it's about you know, priorities, a sense of global priorities. There's so much has to change. So much restructuring of the global economy is needed. Where do you begin? And so our sense is you know, trying to inject a sense of priorities into that. And of course it begins with the people who are on the front line of poverty, people who are dying needlessly. And looking at well, what can be done within the current system to deal with that. And maybe that you know, would create a global sense of solidarity, which would be enough to actually be, uh, put us into a position where we could begin to deal with the more pressing global crises of the environment and so on.